If you have your Bibles, let's go into the Word of God, into Exodus chapter 7, verse 1 till verse 5. It says the following, And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. In the original text, word like is removed. That's why in most of your Bibles, word like is cursive, meaning, and actually that's how it says, I have made you God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart and through I will through and though I will multiply a weird translation <laughs> and though I will multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt the Pharaoh will not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Somebody say praise the Lord even though translation is a little bit different but this meaning is the same if you're taking notes I want to preach a message that will be titled a God to Pharaoh a God to Pharaoh we want to touch a little bit on the story of Moses and in our church we all take notes so if you have a phone and you have a notes app or if you have a notebook with you we ask that you write certain things down that the Lord speaks to you through the message and if you pay attention he will always speak and when you write it down you have a better chance to remember something and so we all encourage our youth and so if you see people on the phones they're not on Facebook well some maybe but most of us we are taking our notes that's how we want to teach our church to take notes and we also want to teach our church to be able, be able to say amen let's practice this somebody say amen amen so it's okay to shout it's okay to speak it's not disturbing it's not a distraction it's a distraction when you fall asleep or when you're on your social media sites while preacher is preaching a God to Pharaoh a story of Moses begins as such that a decree was released by a Pharaoh who was considered the king in those days in Egypt that all the Hebrew boys that will be born they have to be thrown into the Nile or they had to be killed they had to be thrown to the river and drowned and when Moses was conceived we see that his mother and father they loved the baby and they didn't want to throw their baby out and they made a little ark and they put Moses into that little ark and instead of throwing him into the Nile they put him in that ark and Noah and Moses Noah because Noah also had an ark <laughs> a little bit bigger yes Noah's ark Moses ark and there was one more ark in the Bible the ark of God where Moses actually made an ark where people came and, and worshiped God and everything and so Moses goes into the ark and that's how his life is preserved now it's interesting to see that Moses did not make that ark unlike Noah it was made for him Moses didn't find that ark he was placed in it but in that ark he received his salvation and so the first thing that we see from Moses' life that applies to our life is that what the ark was to Moses' life, the cross of Jesus Christ is to ours. Without Jesus' cross, we perish in our sins. Through Jesus' death, his burial and his resurrection, we find our salvation. Salvation from sin, salvation from demons and salvation from darkness. Through Jesus' cross, we find our hope. Jesus' cross provides more than just few pennies, provides more than just good clothes, provides more than just simply a nice house or a great relationship. It provides an eternal salvation from eternal damnation. Can somebody say amen? How many of you are glad for the salvation of Jesus Christ that he has purchased on the cross for you? Sometimes people think that when Jesus was on this earth that Satan wanted Jesus to suffer on the cross. When you watch movies like Passion of the Christ and after that you're like man you get so angry at Satan. Like man he brought so much pain to Jesus. But if you study the Bible you see very clearly that Satan wanted anything but the suffering of Jesus. He tempted Jesus in the wilderness to bypass the cross. 
Satan did not want Jesus to go on the cross. Satan did not want Jesus to suffer because he knew if he will suffer an ark will be made and Moses won't drown. I won't drown. You won't drown. Our generation won't drown. We will have an ark. We will have a place called salvation. That's why when Jesus was dying, it was Satan's worst nightmare becoming a reality. Satan wasn't rejoicing when he was dying. He was being tormented because he knew an ark is being built. My salvation is being rescued. My salvation is being created and it's being formed. And salvation is so much more than forgiveness of sins. If you've been here last Wednesday, you've heard the testimonies that salvation is so much more than having your name written in this wonderful book called life. Even though if that's all the salvation would be, it will be enough. But salvation touches your spirit. It touches your soul. We've heard the testimonies of people who get free from drugs. People who come back to their families and there's joy in the family. Because this person is no longer addicted to certain substances. This person is no longer taking every paycheck and on Friday night driving to Pendleton to spend it on gambling. This person is no longer comes from work and locks himself for four hours in pornography while the kids are over there ignored. And this person is no longer on the weekends drinking himself to sleep and being brought home by someone else. Don't know where they've been and what they've done. But now on the weekends they cut their grass, they take care of their house. This person now is a better worker. He's a better citizen. He's a better husband. He's a better wife. She's a better wife. They're better kids. This person is different. Because salvation not only rescued Moses from the crocodiles, it put him in the palace. That's exactly what salvation is. And that's why we ought to preach the gospel of salvation. That's why we ought to ne never leave the purpose of the church that is to see people saved. Because it's more than just getting people's names in the book of life. It's about getting people's lives into the palace, into the new life, into the blessed life. Somebody say amen. I heard a testimony this morning was out while I was eating breakfast from the, uh, from the ministry that I just came from in Ukraine. This particular lady, um, she lived with her mother and her mother had a very struggling, struggling life. She always went from one boyfriend to another and as a little kid uh, at the age of five she was uh, sexually abused by one of the mother's boyfriends. And that scarred her for, for a very long time. And then uh, because her mother was not being responsible, they took her away from her mother. And in Ukraine, we don't have foster, foster care system, you know, where you are placed into the family. They put you into this place uh, where all of the kids who don't have parents are placed into. It's called internat. And what this is, it's, it's just a hell house. Because you have all these kids who have rage, who have issues, who are placed there. They're usually very rough. There's a lot of really crazy things that happen there. Even when I was in Ukraine, I remember going to school. We knew that you don't mess with those kids. Because though they don't have parents, they also have a lot of issues. And they, they really, really just, just broken kids. So she was placed there for many years. Until one day that she was reconnecting with her mother. Her mother would come and visit her on the weekends. And her mother told her, she said, I love you. And I know God has amazing plans for your life but if I am going to die or if I'm going to pass away I want you to still know that everything is going to be all right with you she looked at her mom and she said mom you're not going to die everything's going to be fine a few weeks later she walks into her mother's place and what she saw next completely destroyed for the, her life for the rest of her life she saw her mother who was pregnant at the time was chopped into pieces by one of her boyfriends and when they did autopsy they found out that her body was stabbed 35 times and she said as a young person seeing that she said it completely destroyed me and inside I went into drugs I went into drinking and then I became homeless for some 10 years lived in the woods picked up garbage and because she lived in the woods she developed she attracted all kinds of diseases where she started to lose weight she started to being immobile with her legs and she found herself laying paralyzed not able to move with her legs because of the amount of sicknesses, the amount of addictions that she had. And she got to such a place she could no longer speak with her vocals. She only whispered and in her thoughts was crying. If there is someone God, let him find me and help me before I die. And lo and behold, somebody did walk into that apartment, found her there. It was two leaders from this church in Ukraine. They prayed for her. She felt a little bit better. 
and they took her from that apartment brought her into their own house and for three months she was living there she was still unable to move but now she received Jesus in her heart and they took her to a crusade that they had in their city and on that crusade in that bed that she was there she got up from that bed began to walk and completely from that day she was completely cured of all diseases and all sicknesses that she had today this woman testified and today she's actually one of the pastors in that ministry she's serving other people and I remember listening to the testimony and thinking salvation is so much more than getting a new heart it's getting a new life it's getting a new future it's getting everything new that's exactly what happened to Moses and that's exactly what must happen to people in our city when we see salvations we will always see miracles when we see salvations we will always see healings when we see salvations we will always see new lives being changed for the glory of God let's give Jesus a round of applause for the saving power to the cross of Jesus <laughs> Moses we see not only Moses he gets saved by the ark but Moses also goes into the palace and in the palace he develops you know a great life he becomes educated Moses becomes prosperous Moses has a powerful position in this in the society and if he's not going to be the next Pharaoh he's definitely going to stick around in the court and be somebody great and the Bible says that after, after some time when being there Moses saw the hurts and the pain that his people were suffering he came back to his palace and decided to resign and completely walk away from that he walked away and went to live with his own people we don't know exactly how things happened but we know that he lived with his own people until one of these times he went in and he attacked one of the Egyptians and the Egyptian died and Moses fled Egypt completely I believe that one of the things that we have to come into our life to the second part of Moses life and it has to happen in our life as well is that where we have to surrender our life to God now you may say well isn't salvation the same thing it's possible to be saved and not surrendered it's possible to be saved and have your life changed and not surrendered it's possible not to smoke and not, not be surrendered. It's possible not to drink and not be surrendered. It's possible to have integrity but not surrender. It's possible to have money but not surrender. A young ruler comes to Jesus and he had everything good. Young ruler, he was a wealthy man and the Bible says, he says, I kept all of the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said okay wow this is awesome and the Bible says Jesus liked him I think on the back of his mind Jesus was thinking man I wish all my disciples were like this <laughs> and Jesus said I want you to do something I want you to give everything away come and follow me and the Bible says he with sadness walked away from Christ and then disciples came to Jesus they said Jesus we sure don't have anything this guy has <laughs> We had pretty rough past but we gave everything to follow you what are we gonna get and Jesus told his disciples he said you're gonna get reward in heaven but I'm gonna also use use you mightily on this earth you know what that means to me God does not really look for perfect people he does not use perfect people he uses surrendered people and sometimes the more perfect you think you are the less surrendered you'll be because your perfection my idea that I'm good becomes a stumbling block for humility and brokenness before God that's why God chose fishermen not because they had achievements not because they even had great moral life but because they had the flexibility in their character to say Lord if we're gonna follow you we're gonna leave everything behind that's why God was able to use Moses why because Moses from before he met God Moses already had in his character the ability to surrender walk away forgive everything for leave everything behind and God says that's kind of a man I'm gonna use Catherine Kuhlman says God doesn't use golden vessels, wooden vessels, bronze vessels. She said God uses yielded vessels. People who yield. That's why you see all the time the people that God uses, you look at them and you're like, man, but he did such a bad things. You know, one thing about these people, it's not what they've done or didn't do. 
It's their ability to leave everything behind and say, God, I surrender. Maybe you're not perfect here today. None of us are perfect. The only time we think we're perfect is when the neighbor behind us, in the front of us, is not doing things that we do. That's the only time we think we're perfect. God is not using perfect people. He will use surrendered people. He will use people who will give up their life for Him. He will use people and the biggest misconception I found with myself is that we sometimes say, when I get better, then I will surrender. When I change, then I will really surrender to God. When I quit smoking, then I will surrender. When I quit doing this, then I will surrender. When I finally find the man that I want to be with and get married, then I will surrender. When I finally finish the school and then I will not be busy, I will surrender. When I finally have a job, pay off my debt, then I will sacrifice and give. I want to tell you something. You, first of all, will never get there without surrender. If you ever get there without surrender, you will never surrender once you're there. Young, young ruler told us this. He arrived in that place and Jesus said, now I want you to surrender. And guess what happened? He walked away being sad. Because surrender is your choice. And that choice has to be made today. Don't wait for crisis. Don't wait for your heart to be broken. Don't wait for some bad thing to happen. If God touches your heart and God calls you by name and says, come and follow me. Drop everything like disciples and says, I'm going to follow you. Don't wait until your life gets shattered and broken for you to surrender. So many people say, I will do drugs, I will smoke, I will have broken relationships and then once I am on the bottom of the barrel, I will cry out to God. Most people I know who were on the bottom of the barrel committed suicide. Not cried out to God. And most, nothing happened when they cried out to God. Because you don't gamble and play games with God. When God calls, you don't reject and then you do what you want to do. You, when He calls, you accept and then He changes your life. Jesus changed Paul's life not when Paul was in crisis. The Bible says Paul was running with his horse passionate to destroy Christians. He had no problems with his health. He had no problems in his finances. Paul's marriage wasn't falling apart. Paul's kids were not strung out on drugs. Paul had a great life, great reputation, connections with the authorities. And God comes as Paul, you're headed in the wrong direction. And Paul said two things, who are you Lord? And the second question was this, what would you have me do? You can always know somebody's greatness by the kind of questions they ask. Most people would ask, why did this happen to me? Why did that happen to me? Those kind of people, that's good, but the better question is God, who are you? What should I do? And God says, Paul, the very people you're going to kill, go to them for advice and they will tell you what you should do. And the Bible says the moment they prayed for him, Paul gets baptized and Paul didn't wait for six months to say, well, I need to get stronger. I need to get stable before I start coming to prayer. I need to get better before I start, you know, kind of really pressing in to start my home group. I need to take some time. The Bible says the next day, Paul gets on the streets and starts preaching God with passion. Confuses people. See, do not wait when God touches your life and you say, God, I give to you my life. Don't wait for everyone to wait for six, seven months to see change. Go hard after God and God will use you. Can somebody say amen? Commitment to God is what he's looking for, not perfection. Even the God people uses are still not perfect. He uses them because they're committed. Because they are surrendered. Not perfect, not always holy, not always strong, not always everything in their life is right. But there's one thing you know about them. When there is Friday night prayer, they will be here. When there is Sunday morning service, whether I'm tired, weak, or I feel bad, I will drag myself over here. Why? Because once I made a deal with God that I'm going to serve Him, I'm going to serve Him. And no devil in hell is going to stop that. And no demon in hell is going to stop that. Why? Because they cannot temper once a man is committed. I remember listening to a man reading a book uh, by a man uh, named Bob Larson who has in his history has cast out, he said documentary, documented 30,000 exorcisms. And he says something very interesting. He says every exorcism that I've done and the studies he's done about people who are demon possessed. He says this is what I found. People who have a strong will and a strong commitment, he says, less likely to have an access or demons have access to them. He said, even if they commit sins that other people commit, 
that cause demons to enter them. He says those people who have a strong will means once they make a decision they stick with it. He says somehow demons cannot enter them. My friends be a person who lives their life surrendered. People will make fun of you say oh you're not good you're not this. Let them say what they want to say but no one thing. God is not looking for perfection. He's looking for surrender. He can always make surrendered people perfect but he can never make perfect people surrendered. He will qualify the called but he doesn't always call the qualified. Amen. The third thing about Moses' life, so we see that Moses is saved by the ark. We see secondly that Moses, his life really takes a churn where Moses begins to commit his life to God. Where he begins to commit his life to a greater cause. And the part that I wanted to talk to you about is the part of him coming eventually to Egypt to deliver his country. To deliver his countrymen from bondage. And when he came in there we see that God begins to share with him the struggle that people had. He begins to share with him the concerns that God has with his people. Now the interesting part is when God was sharing these concerns with Moses, Moses didn't care about it. Moses said, well they're your people, they're struggling, um, I'm not there. And honestly God, I don't give a flip about it. I have a wife, kids, uh, sheep. I got a life, I have a business. And the fact that they are suffering over there, honestly, that's their problem. And God says to Moses, too bad. It's your problem too. He says, you have to be concerned for that. And every selfish man, you know, said, none of my business. I have my own life. It's all, all is good. I'm not going to go into there just to help them. Why? Just for their sake? No. And God says, you have to do that. And Moses begins to, for the first time in his life, go to another season of his life where he begins to take what God cares about and make it what Moses cares about. Each one of us here cares about something. Most likely we care about our life. What are we going to eat? What are we going to sleep? If you have a business, you're probably thinking and care about your business. Your marriage, your family, your finances, your health. It's the things you think about even when they're not happening. I remember when before I left the Ukraine, one of my duplex had a, um, a demon in a sewer pipe. And uh, the, the, the water got stuck there and um, the neighbors, the tenants called on Monday and says, hey, the, there's water not flushing out of the toilet. And, uh, and I was like, hey, just do this. And they did that. And, and when I hang up the phone, I start to care about that duplex. Literally, I'm like thinking, looking at my phone. If any phone call is coming, I'm thinking about that that's going to be them. On Tuesday, they called again. On Wednesday, they called again. I called the city. People came, cleaned up and I went with my father, spent their three hours. Nothing. We're not able to fix it. Then the next day, the service came and they like took them two hours and some 400 bucks and they finally cleaned it. And I remember when I went to Ukraine, I was thinking, I'm like, oh my goodness, for a whole week, I only spent there about maybe two hours, about four hours being there. But I was caring about it for a whole week. I was in Ukraine in the apartment on 23rd floor thinking about a stupid sewer pipe in Richland. <laughs> and in one prayer I couldn't sleep at night because of the time change and I was, I was praying and I felt like Holy Spirit started to deal with my heart. And he said, Vlad, did that sewer pipe got cleansed because you were thinking about it? I said, no. He said, but you feel worse destroys you when you care like that about your life. Doctors have proven you will destroy your health by caring about your life. But you know how you can restore your life? It's when you take the cares God has and put them on yourself. Not that you ignore your life, not that you ignore your family, not that you ignore your business, but you don't care as much as you care about things that will outlast your business, your family, your health and your life. It's the eternity of people's souls. This is the best antidote for depression, the best antidote for anxiety. It's not just simply to find some calm place where you just meditate. It's to replace your anxiety with the anxiety in the heart of God. It's to replace the things that constantly go through your mind and you're going, taking a shower and driving and you're thinking, how am I going to make that money? How am I going to pay for that? How am I going to, the more you think about it, the less ideas you have. 
But if you say, God, I'm going to flip this over and think about what you're thinking about. People getting saved and people getting healed. You will find your own problems being taken care of by God. Your health being restored and the Holy Spirit connecting with you. We cannot save souls if we only pray about them but we don't care. We don't act anxious. Our heart is not heavy with it and we don't think about it and if, when we don't think about it like that, guess what happens? Satan will load our mind with the things to think about that will destroy our health, ruin our, 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 our mind and our body organs. Receive consciously care for souls. Moses receives that. Then he goes to his country. And we see he goes to his people in Egypt and when he is there he goes straight to Pharaoh. He says, Pharaoh you gotta let my people go. Pharaoh says, what? Pharaoh says, I am God. In Egypt if you study history of Egypt you find out that every Pharaoh was considered God Ra. It means they were the God of Sun. They were considered God. People worshiped them as God, they acted as God and they lived as gods. And here's Moses as ex-slave walks in and says, you have to let all of your slaves go, destroy your financial history, your, your economy, completely wreck yourself because God told me so. And then Moses does few simple tricks that God taught him, you know, supernaturally to do. And, and, Mo, and Pharaoh brings his guys, they do a few tricks and cast Moses out. And instead of that, Pharaoh increases the, the workload for the Israel. So now not only Pharaoh doesn't like Moses, Israel come to Moses say you put a sword in Pharaoh's hand get out of our face we were slaves but at least we we had some straw for our bricks you came with your God ideas and now we don't have straw and we're still slaves get out and here is Moses in chapter 6 at the end he says God I like the idea of helping your people you like the idea I like the idea it started really good but it went really south and that's where Moses throws self-pity and says, God, I told you from the beginning, I'm not a good speaker. I am not the right person. Don't use me. Pharaoh calls Moses now. You don't see Moses pleading because Moses knew. Now Pharaoh, you're not letting our people go only for one reason. Because not all of your gods has been crushed to the ground. When you walk in a revelation, of who you are in God before you see your situation change when we walk in the revelation in our city not just caring for souls but praying for souls and in our prayer that we don't take the position of these little people trying to convince everyone to be a part of our religious group but that we realize there is a spiritual world that holds our city and our regions captive the god of frogs the god of pornography the god of gambling the god of smoking the god of divorce these different gods and when we are praying for revival remember our goal is not just to get people saved our goal is also to demolish and crush the gods satan has established in our region and in our generation can somebody say amen And that comes with a revelation that you and I in the spiritual world are superior to everything the enemy has built. If we wait until our situation changes to know that you are in a place of authority, that will not happen. First things change in chapter 7 in Moses' mind. God says, I make you a God to Pharaoh and plagues begin. Plagues was a punishment by a superior power. To a lower power the power of Egypt we are going to see in our city the gods that Satan has established that keep people hostage these gods will one by one be brought down by the power of God not from heaven but from the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us you and I are in a place of authority in a spiritual world. We might be ex-slaves. We might be ex-drug addicts. We might be ex-alcoholics. We may be ex-adulterers. We might be ex-this and ex-that. But I want to tell you when God says that He is the King of Kings. That's us. We are no longer ex. We are now in authority. 
we are now in a place of victory. We are now in a place of God's rulership. We pray out of that place and out of that place we see the enemy backing down. Out of that place we see Satan pleading, begging, fleeing, falling and letting go. And that's exactly what the plan of God is. And God said on purpose to Pharaoh, I will harden his heart. Why? So that you don't leave Egypt without destroying every one of their gods. I'm not just interested in helping your people. I'm interested to get the point across to the enemy. You are defeated. When we pray for revival, when we pray for our friends, when we pray for our city, we don't have to expect that things will always go like we expect. But at the end, we have to know one thing. We will win. The enemy will be defeated. And people will be saved. In Jesus' name. Maybe you prayed for someone, they responded to Jesus, and you don't see them coming back to God. And you go back to the old pattern. Oh God, I knew I'm not good enough. I should have not been the one. I don't even should be doing witnessing because everybody I bring, they don't really get saved. They don't really get touched. That's an old Moses. A new Moses has to walk into a court of a Pharaoh saying, I am in a place of authority. Not because I'm all this great and almighty. It's because I know the Lord. And because I know the Lord, he makes me Lord over my circumstances. And Pharaoh is not my God creator of heaven and earth is my God and with him I will ride over every situation in Jesus name. Can somebody say amen.